I want to talk about um, how the resurrection impacts and changes our values. And I want to take a look at that through the life of the Apostle Paul. And so um, I, I'm, we're going to take a look at scripture and let, and let scripture speak to us. Uh, so we all know the story of Paul. And if you got your Bibles open, let's, let's turn to, uh, let's turn to the book of Acts. And we're going to look at Paul on the road to Damascus. So you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 9. We'll have it up here on the screen, but Acts chapter 9. And uh, we'll start with uh, verse, verse 4 and 5. Here, here's the Apostle Paul. And Paul has been on a mission. And the mission Paul's been on is to destroy the early church, to arrest, persecute, prosecute, throw in prison, uh, and even help put to death um, all of those individuals who are saying that this, this rabbi that was uh, crucified by the Romans for claiming that he was king of the Jews, and now you got all these people running around saying he's resurrected and he's the Messiah. Oh, heck no, Paul wasn't going for that. Paul was committed to destroying the legacy of Jesus's mission and he persecuted the church. And Paul's now on the way with letters in his hand, like warrants in his hand. He's on his way to Damascus to arrest and imprison more Christians. And that's where uh, our story picks up. Uh, Acts chapter nine, uh, verse four. We'll start with verse four and we'll read um, I'll read Acts chapter 9, verse 4 and 5. Here's Paul. He's on his road to Damascus. And then the bright shining light comes to Paul as he's riding on the road to Damascus. And we pick up the text where it says, he fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. So, so, so Paul has this encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Paul didn't believe that Jesus had been resurrected. That's why he set out to pers persecute the church. But now Paul has this encounter. Pick it up, verse eight and nine. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. And so they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Skip past a couple of verses here, verse 19 and 20. It says, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the son of God. So here we have this radical transformation by the apostle Paul. He goes from persecuting the church. He goes from being on a mission to destroy the church to now he encounters a resurrected Jesus. He's blinded for three days, right? Blinded for three days. He regains his sight. He goes down to, to, to report to, to, to the disciples. The disciples are kind of weary, like, they go, this was the dude that was running around trying to arrest us. And then Paul, almost seemingly overnight, everything changed for Paul. And he goes from persecuting the church to preaching that Jesus is the son of God. What motivates somebody to do that? A true encounter. He had a true encounter. Yeah. Paul, Paul, Paul 
was offended by Christianity. He was offended by the ideal that this crucified criminal could be the Messiah. He was offended. But when he realized that Jesus had been raised from the dead, when he encountered the resurrection, didn't matter what offended him anymore. It, it, it didn't matter what he believed, what he thought, his, his traditions, his values. It didn't matter because the resurrection was true. He couldn't deny it. He, he couldn't reason it away from the scriptures. He, could, he couldn't do anything. He had to confront and come face to face with the shattering reality of this one that I've been trying to destroy his legacy and his work. I have now personally encountered him myself. See, we can't encounter the resurrection and not have it affect our values. Let me say it again. We, we, we can't encounter the resurrection and not have the resurrection impact our values. Now, somebody give me a couple of things that we know about the life of the Apostle Paul. After this encounter, after this transformation, what's Paul's legacy? What do we know about Paul? To what degree did this impact have on him? Well, I know that after uh, he encountered the risen Christ, he went to uh, see the apostles, and I'm sure that they were blown away at some guy named Paul knocking on their door because he was a killer of Christians. Mm -hmm. But they welcomed him because of uh, they knew that he was encountered by the way he spoke. I'm, I'm certain that they knew. And they welcomed him into their homes, and um, they just uh, they did that. I'll say that, that they did that. They welcomed him. And um, the community, the community of the believers welcomed Paul, right? Yeah. What else do we know about Paul's life? Didn't he go on to write a large portion of the Bible or a portion of? A large portion of the New Testament. Paul is the author. Paul's the author of a large portion of the New Testament. Paul spent 36 years preaching about the one Jesus that he was trying to persecute, building the church that he was attempting to destroy. Paul is probably one of the most prominent of the early church leaders that laid the foundation, was responsible for the establishment of the church, the early church, in most of the known cities of the world because all of the all of the names of the books of the bible and the epistles are all major cities where paul established the mission and work of christ so so paul's life was radically transformed radically transformed what we want to look at today is what are the principles that we can draw from what does paul tell us that were the driving mechanisms what were the values that enabled an individual who was committed to destroying something. And because of his encounter with the resurrected Jesus, now became committed, gave his life to building what he was once committed to destroying. Because I, I, I would throw this out to us. We can't encounter the resurrection. We can't encounter a resurrected Jesus and not have it change our lives. And, Today, we want to understand how it changes our values. So turn to, to Philippians chapter 3. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. And we're going to take a look at this portion of scripture. And this is probably Paul's, uh, uh, this is uh, 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 this kind of like Paul's, what do you call it? Manifesto, if you will, uh, here in the book of Philippians. So, 
Paul writes this in the book of Philippians. Paul's at the end of his life. He's at the end of the, his ministry. All the things that you and I know about the apostle Paul, all the things that he's accomplished in building the work of God and in laying the foundation for the church, all of those things have now happened. Now Paul is at the end of his life. He's at the end of his life. He's sitting in the prison in Rome and he's writing to the city of Philippi. And this is kind of like his last letter that he writes. All that we know about Paul, he's accomplished. He's been there. He's done that. Here's a man at the end of his life. And he's, he's given us insight into what were the values that drove him, that shaped him as a result of encountering this resurrected Jesus. I'm, I'm going to read this text, and then we're, we're going to read the text in its entirety um, from verse 4 uh, down to uh, verse 14. It's okay if we, if, if we as Christians read a lot of scripture, right? That, that, that's okay, right? Um, and then we're going to come back, and we're going we're gonna to take four foundational principles out of that text, right? And we'll take each text bit by bit, but, but, but I want us to see um, kind of like this manifesto that Paul writes. So Philippians chapter three, verse four, right? Paul, Paul, Paul starts off in Philippians chapter three in the earlier verses. Paul talks about his legacy, his lineage, where he comes from, that he's from the tribe of Benjamin, his, his, his spiritual accolades, all the things that provide the basis and foundation for success. Paul says, I'm, I'm, I'm all of that. I was, I was born and circumcised on the eighth day. I'm, I'm, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. It's touching the law. I'm a Pharisee. I was blameless. I did all this stuff, right? And now here Paul says, though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. And then he, he articulates, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a, I'm a poor blood, a pure blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I, I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I, I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. Now he tells us, he says, I once thought all these things were so very important. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have discarded everything else counting it all as garbage. Why, Paul? So that I may have Christ. Not only have him, but become one with him. I no longer count on my own goodness or my ability to obey God's law, but I trust Christ to save me. For God's way of making us right with himself it depends on faith. As a result of depending on faith, not my own works, as a result, I can really know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I, I can learn what it means to suffer with him, sharing in his death. Why? So that somehow I can experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that, that, that I've already achieved these things. Or that I have already reached perfection. But I keep working toward that day. When I will finally be all that Christ Jesus saved me for and wants me to be. No, dear brothers and sisters, I'm, 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 I'm still not all I should be. I haven't arrived. 
not perfect. He says, but I'm focusing all my energies on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us up to heaven. Just on the hearing of that text there, just to, just first read, because we're, we're, we're going to take it and we're going to break it down. Just at the first reading of what I would call Paul's kind of manifesto, what if anything stands out? Paul was sold out. Paul was sold out. He was convinced and sold out to Christ. Yeah, I like that. Convinced and sold out. Someone else was going to add something? I'm not adding anything after that. That was good, Marv. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> convinced That's cool. That's and cool. sold out. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think of this portion of scripture as, as Paul's manifesto. He, he's writing and telling us what drove him. Paul, how, how did you go from the dude trying to destroy the church to the dude that built the church? What was your thought process? What were your attitudes? What were your motivations? There's much we can learn and extract from it. There's a lot in this text. I'm just trying to draw four foundational basic principles for you and I to think of as a lens of how we can evaluate the impact of our experience with the resurrection. And to ask ourselves, are we experiencing the same transformation of values that Paul experienced, that drove and shaped his life and his ability to do far more than what you and I would ever do. First thing for us to understand is his resurrect, what, what, what his, meaning Jesus, what his resurrection changes for us. It changes our perspective. It changes our perspective. Look what Paul writes. Philippians 3, 7 and 8. Let's go back. We'll, we'll go back. We'll take each of these portions of scripture and we'll kind of break them down. So Philippians 3, verse 7 and verse 8. If someone wants to read verse 7 and 8 for us, please. I'll read 7. Uh, I once thought of all these things. They were very, very so important. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Eight. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I have declared everything else, counting it as garbage so that I may have Christ. Thank you, Brother Marv. Thank you, Brother Marv. So, 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 so perspective. Perspective. His resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus, when we've encountered the resurrected Jesus, one of the evidences of that is our perspective changes. What in this text does Paul say about his perspective? What in his perspective changed? But one thing I wanted, reason why I wanted to jump and read this is because, yep. you know, that's what I had noticed earlier that no matter what he has accomplished or, I mean, because he was the man, man, when it came to Pharisees, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, Paul, he had credentials, he had money, Paul was the man, and he said, I counted all worthless, done. 
compared to what Christ has done for him yeah. or compared to Christ. Perspective. What's important to you? Like really, don't, 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 don't think or say to yourself the things that you think a Christian should say to answer that question. Like on the real, let's be honest with our own hearts. What's important to us? Most of us are at an age where, you know, we have responsibilities, we got careers, we got stuff. That stuff's important, right? God wants us to be able to provide for our families, absolutely, right? God wants us to be successful, whatever our hands find to do, do all to the glory of God. God wants us to be successful on our job. I, I personally believe Christians should be the best employees, right, in a place. What's important to us? Paul said the things that he wants thought were important, prestige, status, right? Paul came from a very wealthy family. You say, well, how do you know that? Paul was a Jew, but he was a Roman citizen. And the city he came from was Tarsus. Tarsus was a seaport, right? It was like the New York City of his day. And for a Jew to have Roman citizenship, they had to be wealthy and they had to purchase that. You say, well, how do you know Paul was a Roman citizen? Because later on, this is how Paul ended up in Rome where he was killed because he got tired of taking those whoopings. And he said, wait a minute, I'm a citizen. You got to take me to Caesar. I'm tired of y'all whooping up on me. I want to go and be judged by Caesar. That was his right as a citizen. So Paul said all this stuff, like Marvin said, all this stuff, prestige, credentials. Paul said, you know what? My perspective on this stuff has changed. I don't think about it the way that I used to think about it. It used to be really important to me. But now he says, I, you know what? I consider them worthless. And here's, here's, here's the important kind of modifier in this. He says, I consider them worthless. Why does he consider them worthless? That's of what Christ has done. In comparison to the cross. In comparison uh, to the resurrection. Pa pa Pastor Dave, can yes. I read the, the message version of, of uh, 7, 7 through 9? It, 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 it touches a couple other things. Would that be okay? I, I, can, I, I can, can, can you guys hear J James? You're going in. I can hardly hear you. Uh oh. Um. Sorry. You're, uh, you're just real faint. Can can you hear me better now? There you go. Much better. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. We, we, we had it on the speaker, you know, blasting the service through the house. <laughs> but, but, but now I have it on the phone speaker. All, All right. right. Uh, so uh, Philippians 7 through 9 in the message. The very credentials these people are waving around as something special. I'm tearing up and throwing out with the trash, along with everything else I used to take credit for. And why? Because of Christ. Yes, all the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life, compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus as my master firsthand. Everything I once thought I had going for me is insignificant. Dog dung. <laughs> I've dumped it all in the trash so mm. that I could embrace Christ and be uh, embraced by him. I didn't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that mm. comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ. God's righteousness. That's powerful. See, yeah, that's good. See, Paul's perspective had changed. There were things he valued that were important. And in the world, they are important. But Paul said, once I came into this thing 
And when I compare those things to Jesus and what he's done, they're worthless. They're not worthless in and of themselves by themselves. He says, when I put them in a larger context of what it means to be in Christ and what the implications of his resurrection in my life are, man, they really don't matter. They're really not significant. And I think this is really, really important. You know, he says, I count them all as garbage, as dung, compared to gaining the knowledge of Jesus. See, guys, I want to say this, and I want to say it with the right heart, and I want to say it with the right spirit so it's not misperceived what I'm trying to say here. Can't love God and man. Our perspective, when we've encountered the resurrection, our perspective changes because that perspective is informed and empowered for choice. What Paul is saying is, when I understood what it meant to know Christ and to have Christ, I made a choice. And the choice I made was to change my perspective and my value on stuff I built my whole life around. He says, I count it all as garbage so that I may have Christ. Now, just stop and think about that for a moment. James, in their, their, uh, read, read the end of verse 8 in, in the message. Okay. Uh, he has it kind of, uh, the way they have, you know how they do 7 through 9. So uh, maybe it's this. Um, I dumped it all in the trash so that I could embrace Christ and be embraced by him. That's the part I, mean, I that's the part I wanted. No, notice what Paul is saying here. The motivation for dumping it in the trash. What does he tell us? The motivation for counting it all as nothing, for changing his perspective on status and and and, and wealth and accomplishment and achievement right? The motivation for the changing of that perspective is so that he can have Christ. There's an implication in that statement. There's an implication in that statement. The implication is, if I hang on to the perspective of the world, if I continue to value those things in the world, what does that mean in terms of my relationship to Christ. You can hinder it. Yeah, you can't have Christ and mammon. Come on, sis. Can't <laughs> serve two masters. There it is. His perspective changed. When he encountered the risen Lord, mm. everything for Paul changed. We tell the world we've encountered the risen Lord. What is the evidence of the change in our perspective? Colossians 3.1 tells us this. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights, some of your translation says your thoughts or your mind, on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the right hand of God in the of honor. Let heaven fill your thoughts. Don't think only about the things down here on earth. Perspective. Perspective. What fills your thoughts? Earthly stuff? Heavenly thoughts, though. Now, we got responsibilities. We got stuff we got to deal with, right? Those of us, you know, we got, we got responsibilities. We got businesses. We got, we got well, we got stuff. It, it's not saying, don't worry. It's, it's, it's not saying, throw all that stuff out. No, 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 no. It's the perspective. What fills my thoughts? It's not saying, don't think about your responsibilities, but what fills your thoughts? 
heaven or things on earth? Because it's hard to have that perspective Paul's talking about if earthly things are filling my thoughts. So here's what Paul is basically saying to us. I got to pick up speed here. Here's what Paul is saying to us. Jesus said this to his disciples. He, he, he said, hey, you're, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. You see, the world has a value system. And, and, and the world's value system is on wealth. It's on status. It's on all the stuff Paul was saying. I'm done with all that. It's credentials. It's on all that stuff, right? We evaluate and we judge people. Yep, even us as Christians, come on, let's be honest. We judge and evaluate people on all the stuff Paul said he was done with. But Jesus said, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And what Paul was saying was, listen, I learned not to be driven by the world's value system. That when I encountered this resurrected Jesus, the impact of that was I'm no longer governed and under the control and influenced by what the world values. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. So when the world says red bottom shoes is the hottest thing going on, ladies, you ain't got to break your neck to try to get a pair of red bottom shoes because the world says that's the hottest thing going on. When the world starts tattooing his bodies like crazy, you as a Christian, you feel that you have to go and get tattoos now too. Why? Because the world's doing that. The world shouldn't shape and influence what you and I do as believers. Paul said, I have a perspective. And my perspective is, I'm, I'm counting all the stuff in the world, all the world's values. All the things the world says is important. I'm putting that stuff in the trash can because it can hinder my ability to gain Christ. Oh, I can be saved, yes. But the degree to which the fullness of Christ is manifested in my life, it can be hindered because I can't love two things at once. What are some of the, what are some of the other things that you think the world's value systems that we tend to get caught up in. Image is a big one. Image, money, fame. Mm-hmm. Definitely politics. Mm -hmm. Parties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and think about this, and I'm I, like, this is going to sound really, really orthodox, but you know, sometimes you got to, you got to, you got to like, you got to push it to kind of liberate ourselves from things. For many of us, myself included, we're influenced by the world more than we think. And we don't necessarily think that we're influenced by the world because we've been in it so long. We've been in, in it so long, ingrained in it so long, and I'm just going to say it, I don't intend to hurt anybody's feelings. And we don't spend a lot of time in the word to understand what the kingdom is like, what, what the kingdom values, right? Because there's two kingdoms are in. The world's values represent the kingdom of darkness. We're in the kingdom of light. We spend so much time operating in the kingdom of darkness, we can't discern. It's difficult to discern where the values contradict because we've been in it so long. Paul said, my perspective has changed. And this is the foundation. Without that change in perspective, without letting go of this stuff, Paul's never going to do the things that he did. He's never going to pursue a life of service to God because he would have hung on to the things he thought was important. But once he determined those things were no longer important, it liberated his heart. 
It liberated his mind. It empowered his spirit to press forward. What do you value? What's really important to you? And have you made the decision because you've encountered the resurrected Jesus that compared to having him and knowing him, this stuff don't mean nothing. Compared to having Jesus and knowing Jesus, my money don't mean nothing. Compared to having Jesus and knowing Jesus, my dot, 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 dot means nothing. I'm willing to give it all up compared to him. Jesus' resurrection changes for us our perspective. Paul's perspective on what he valued and what he thought was important changed. Because gaining Christ was more important than gaining anything he could gain in the world. The second thing that we see for Paul in his manifesto to us, that he writes again at the end of his life, he's looking back, he's telling us the secret of his success, the framework, the pattern, the template for his spiritual success of service to God. His perspective changed. But the resurrection also changes our passion. Philippians 3, 9 through 11. Someone read that for us, please. So that I may have Christ become one with him, I no longer count my own goodness or my ability to obey God's laws, but I trust Christ to save me. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Next verse. As a result, I can really know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I can learn what it's made, what it means to suffer with him, sharing in his death so that somehow I can experience the re resurrection from the dead. Sorry. All right. So in this, in this portion of scripture here, where do you see Paul's passion? is to know and experience the mighty power of Christ. He yeah. wants to know him. But here's a, it's interesting though, he said he wants to suffer with him in his death. So he's willing to, man, listen. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to cost us. Mm. Look at his passion. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's his passion. Look what he, look, look what he says here. He says, I'm giving up all that stuff, right? Seven and eight, give, give, giving it all up, right? Why? Because I want to become one with Christ. I want, I want to be down with him, right? Mm -hmm. But the, the passion that drives me, that fuels my change in perspective is I want to know Jesus. Mm -hmm. I want to become one with him. I want to trust him for making me right. Not my own labor, not my own self-righteousness. So I do this and I do that and I do this and I do that. No, he said, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm not caught up in that anymore. I'm, I'm caught up in knowing, knowing Christ. I'm caught up in experiencing, notice, in experiencing the power that raised him from the dead. Paul encountered the resurrected Jesus, but not only does he want to encounter, not, how do I say this? Come get myself excited here. I'm about to preach because then... Paul's saying it wasn't enough to experience the resurrected Jesus. He wanted to experience that power of the resurrection himself. Mm. See, and, and remember, as we've been teaching this, the Bible says that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that same power is in you and I. Yeah. Every day, you and I have the ability to experience the resurrection daily in our lives. That's why I say it's not a holiday. 
Paul says, I can really know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Watch this. I can learn what it means to suffer with him, sharing in his death. What do you think he means by that statement? Because this is his passion. Is he saying whatever it takes, no matter what it is, I am willing to do that? When, when he say, I'm going to die, it doesn't matter. He's so dedicated to Christ that his life does not matter to him. It's all about living and dying for Christ to self, right? Yep. Yep. You said it, per okay. you said it perfectly. Can, can, Go ahead, brother. Wait, can, can, can I ask you a question? Let's go back just a little bit to perspective. Because in my head, and I don't know if this happened to everybody, but for me, could it be um, because that experience that Paul experienced with Christ on that road to D Damascus, um, it caused him to go blind. It caused him to experience something fear that he had never known because he was the man, he was in control of everything, and he did whatever he wanted to do before he met Christ. Meeting Christ on that road caused him to be fearful at first, and then when he got his sight back, um, he knew that he encountered Christ. But for us, that same, that same experience that, that Paul experienced, could it be fear for me? Of, of knowing that my, to change my perspective and to do the works of Christ, that I am fearful that the devil going to come in and take away from me because now I am, my life is, do you know what I mean? Like, oh, I don't know if I'm explaining this right, but I think that is the problem with me. I fear that the devil is going to come and take everything that I accomplished when it shouldn't mean anything to me, and yet it does. Because my perspective is not changed, but don't you gotta still go through stuff? I don't know. Okay. No. Okay. So, so, so. Here's here's a way to think of it, right? And this is where um, I, I want to be very careful how I say this. Pastor, I need you to I need you to say it the way we're gonna understand it. Everybody, <laughs> please forgive him if he's gonna hurt any of our feelings, but we need no seriously, you know, because I understand what you're saying. You don't want to cause anybody to think, you know, crazy or I get yeah. that, but at the end of the day, we need realness. Cause, so because cause right now we're in a season where yes. the enemy is challenging. And trying to activate our flesh to resist this teaching. Absolutely. Yes. Because it yes. because because this teaching makes we, we we realize that we've been seduced into a comfortability of something we thought yep. true and real. And now when we're looking at scriptures, we're realizing we've been robbed. Been robbed. We've been robbed. So Brenda, so so here, here's the question. So I have, to, I have to have this one central confidence. And the one central confidence I have to have is that as I surrender to Christ more of my life, that everything that God wants to be in my life, I have to trust him that he'll place it there. I, I, I have to trust him with all of my life. And, and, and that means trusting him with what I have and what I don't have that he knows better for me, that he will move things in my life and he will move things out of my life as he see fit and trusting that. So I'll give you an example. No, I don't wanna use myself as an example. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think biblically here. Um, take, take Joseph, for instance. All mm -hmm. the stuff that happened to Joseph, all the stuff Joseph experienced, the things that were put in his life, the things that were taken out of his life. It was only, it wasn't until later on, because I'm sure when Joseph was in the pit, 
What do you think he was feeling? I don't think there was a praise God, hallelujah, in the pit. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. There was a praise God, hallelujah, in the prison, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Only at the end of the process did Joseph have an understanding that God was the one at work all the time. All the time. Okay. That means that it appears that the devil might be doing, the one ultimately in charge is God. Yeah, that's good, Dave, because because Joseph, it always says that God was with him. Yep. See, we preach a false gospel. See, the, mm -hmm. the false yeah. gospel, the false gospel that a lot of churches preach, and you can draw a crowd doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They preach about your haters, right? Mm -hmm. Preach about your haters. You know, it's always the devil. And it makes us think that the devil has more power than God. Mm -hmm. Right. That the, hey, yes. The devil can just come into our lives and tear up and tear down and just turn over and God's just sitting on the side like, oh my God, what are we going to do? How are we going to help Brenda? Right. And that, yes. that, 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 that he has no authority over us. The only authority he has is what we surrender to him by surrendering to our lust and our flesh. Yeah. So it's not a question of what the devil can take from us because he can't take anything from us because okay. we don't belong to him anymore. Yeah. Okay. But there is, Brenda, right. but Brenda, there is, uh -huh. there is the possibility that for a short season, he may move things in or out of our life right. that we are comfortable with. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. I I'm starting to get this thing because just like you say, and I'm not trying to put any churches down, but at the end of the day, for me, this world and me being under you is, is, it is, it's one of those things where you cry a lot. I know for me, because I know a lot of me are dying to the things that I have learned yep. in other churches that didn't speak um, the truth, that didn't allow our eyes to be open to see what God is really trying to show us. And, and with, the, with, with you and, and with the Lord using you. It's allowing my eyes to be open and allowing me to shut a lot of the world off of me so that I can be complete in Christ. And there's still a ways to go, but it's helpful. So thank you. Yeah, so so think so so think about what, what Paul is saying here, Brenda. And this 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 all piggybacks. So so what Paul is saying is my ability to change my perspective is what empowers my passion. Because when I'm no longer trying to hang on to stuff, I can pursue with passion knowing Christ. And he's telling us that knowing Christ isn't intellectual. It's yeah. not intellectual. It's not how many Bible verses you know. It's not how much how much you can talk. Because, you know, Christians, we love talking, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we love talking. Yeah, we yeah, yeah. Yeah. preach each mm -hmm. other, you know. <laughs> you know. Y'all know how we do as Christians, right? And what Paul is saying is, listen, there's a passion to know Christ. Because when you give up the perspective in all of your passions that are associated with the things of the world, when you let that go, that passion now shifts. And it shifts to wanting to know Jesus. And he says, wanting to know Jesus is an experience. And I experience knowing Jesus when I allow the resurrection power, that mighty power that raised him from the dead. He says, I can experience that. Well, how do I experience that? When I suffer with him. Mm -hmm. And when he says share in his death, you were right, Brenda, when you said it's dying to self. He's yeah. not telling us to go out there and take a bullet. No. Right. I ain't trying to go. No, Listen, I ain't trying. I ain't trying to get to heaven before I have to. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, I, I'm just being honest. I'm just being like real honest. Right, here, right? Right. <laughs> listen, listen, if the Lord say take a bullet, I'm taking a bullet. But right, if, right, right. if there ain't no instruction for taking a bullet, I'm ducking that bullet. <laughs> so, 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 so to your point, Brenda, what he's saying here isn't, isn't physical dying. There's a more difficult death than physically dying because you physically die how many times? 
once. But yeah, you why? died to self how many times? Continuously. Continuously. Daily. Daily. Yeah. Take up your cross. <laughs> Follow me. What he means when he said, I can learn what it means to suffer with him. Mm. Okay. Dying to self, living out. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, but wow. never I live, but not I, it's Christ. It's living out the suffering of Christ, the crucifixion of my flesh on a daily basis. Mm. The Bible says this about Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus learned obedience. How? Through the things suffered. which he suffered. He learned, Jesus learned obedience through the things in which he suffered. Well, what are the things in which he suffered that can help us to understand how we suffer with him? Gethsemane. What was Gethsemane? He said, listen, I ain't that, listen, we need to think this whole cross thing here, Lord. I know this was our plan from the beginning, but this gonna hurt. And I'm the author of life. And now I got to taste death for stuff I ain't even do. Can we rethink this? Right? <laughs> it, it's just a couple of lines in scripture, but it's so much. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. That's what it means to suffer with him. It's the giving up. It's the surrender of our will, sharing in his death. What was his death? He surrendered his will. That's how he ended up on the cross. The thief beside him said, man, listen. If you all that, man, get listen, get, get, get yourself down and get us down too. Jesus, I could call legions of angels to get me down from here. But I'm learning obedience to the things in which I suffer. Paul says he had a passion. And his passion was to know Jesus. And knowing Jesus isn't just information. It's experiencing the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's allowing ourselves to experience that daily as we die to self and then live through the resurrected power of Christ in us. That's what he means at the end here where he says, so that somehow I can experience the resurrection from the dead. That's not the statement. When you look at this in the, in, in the original language, that's not a statement where Paul is saying, well, maybe I'm saved, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not. No, that's not what he's saying. The key thing is, it is somehow I can experience the resurrection. What Paul is talking about is experiencing that power of his resurrection when I die to self. The more that I can surrender, the more that I can give myself over, I am experiencing the resurrection daily. That's why it's not a holiday. It's a daily reality for us. It's a continual experience for us. Paul had a passion by which he was willing to pursue that experience. And watch this. Look, look what Paul says about his own experience. What's the evidence of Paul's passion to know Christ? Well, this is this. This, 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 this is what he wrote in 1 Corinthians. Because remember, Philippians is at the end of his life. So we can look back. Well, is what Paul writing at the end? Is there any evidence of this? Look, in 1 Corinthians, he says, to this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty without enough clothes to keep us warm. We have endured many beatings. And we have no homes of our own. We have worked wearily with our own hands to earn our living. We bless those who curse us. We are patient with those who abuse us. We respond gently when evil things are said about us, yet we are treated like the world's garbage, like everybody's trash, right up to this persistent moment. Paul said, I've experienced. I've suffered with him. Paul didn't have an easy ministry. Paul didn't have a book deal. 
Paul didn't get the chief seats in the banquet halls. All the stuff that we think about today and, and praise God if he got a book deal. Listen, I'll, I'll, listen, I'll sign a contract. Give me one. That ain't what I'm saying. I ain't saying it's wrong. I'm saying there's a perspective that we've lost. And the perspective we can see of what fueled Paul's life was he had a passion to know Jesus. And that passion to know Jesus is what fueled and enabled him to experience and endure during great, great hardships. Look what he says. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We've been beaten. We've been put in jail. We face angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and we went without food. This is Paul's Christian experience. And he endured all that because he had a passion to know Jesus. What are you willing to endure in your passion to know Jesus? What are you willing to encounter in your passion to know Jesus? We've been lied to that the Christian life is a life full of nothing but blessings, nothing but good, positive things. No hardships coming your way. Confess it and decree it, you know, but that's not the reality. The Bible does not support that perspective. But you can preach that and draw a crowd. But the Bible doesn't support that perspective. And maybe that's why so many of us as Christians, so many of our brothers and sisters in the Lord, we don't really live with the power of Christ operating in our life. Because we haven't learned to change our perspective. We still value what the world values. And we put God's name on it. We put our pursuit of those things on as being blessed by the Lord. We don't have the passion to suffer with him so that we can experience him. We don't want to be inconvenienced. We're Americans. We don't, we, don't, we don't deal with inconvenience. We want everything to be convenient. It's part of our culture. The third thing that we understand that the resurrection changes for us is our purpose. The resurrection changes our purpose. Look what Paul says in Philippians 3.12. He says, I, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things. What things? Knowing Christ, experiencing the power of his resurrection, suffering with him, right? He says, I, I don't mean to say I've already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. Paul says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a continued work in progress. He said, but I, I keep working toward the day when I will finally be all that Christ Jesus saved me for and wants me to be. Purpose. The resurrection changes our perspective, changes our passion, changes our purpose. What is the purpose Paul identifies here in this text? To be all that Christ Jesus saved and wants him to be. Yep. This Paul's at the end of his life, man. He's accomplished everything that we know of Apostle Paul. All that's been accomplished now as he writes this letter to the Philippians. But look at his attitude. He's in jail. Yeah. <laughs> but look at his attitude. He's mm. He's working toward that day. Yeah. I'm pressing. I'm striving. I'm working towards the day when I will finally be all that Christ Jesus saved me for and wants me to be. Paul's oh. I want to fulfill the reason 
God brought me into this thing in the first place. You know, the book of Ephesians chapter one, it tells us that God called us according to his plan and according to his purpose. So here, here's what God is saying. When he selected you, he had a plan for you. He had a purpose for you. You didn't just, you, you, you didn't just randomly get saved. God in his infinite wisdom and sovereign knowledge had a plan and a purpose for you. Paul tells us that part of that purpose, the universal purpose that God has that's, that's consistent for all of us is to be like Jesus. Paul said, in all that I do, I'm, I'm, I'm still working towards because I've changed my perspective, it liberates me to pursue a passion. That passion is to know and experience Christ through, through, through dying to self. And the more that I experience Christ through dying to self, and I continue that, and I work towards that, I know it's going to help me to finally be and achieve all that Christ Jesus saved me for and wants me to be. There's a thread, there's a connection. All that Christ Jesus saved me for and wants me to be. We hear this verse all the time. I share this verse all the time because I think there's so much power in this verse. And I was like, oh, Lord, I, gotta, I gotta use another verse, Lord, because I use this verse all the time. And God said, no, that's the verse. Use it all the time because it's true all the time. Someone read Romans 8, 28, 29 for us. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Is that your purpose? Is that your purpose? To be like Jesus, to be conformed to the image of his son. And, and, and that word conformed is a particular word. That, that that root word conformed, it, it, it gives the picture of when they would take leather and then when they would carve or ingrain into leather. That's that picture of that word conformed. It's where we get the it's where we get the word character. Conformed to the image. It's really a picture of something being engraved and carved into something to represent something else. See, when there's a passion to endure hardships and sufferings and experience Christ so that we can experience the power of the resurrection, it facilitates the purpose that God has for us, which is to be Christ-like. Now, I've been around Christians for a long time. Many of you have been around Christians as long as I have, right? And, and, and I've been guilty of this. In, in, in my walk with the Lord, I think I've been honest with you guys, where for a season in my life, I was a full-time pastor and a part-time disciple. I was a professional pastor and a part-time disciple. We can do a lot of religious activities and functions. That's not God's goal. The ultimate thing God wants, the thing Paul was in pursuit of, was to be conformed to be like Jesus. At the end of his life, he says, I want to be all that God saved me for. And this verse tells us the primary thing God saved us for wasn't to take up a role in children's ministry or to be an usher, all this other stuff. The primary thing God saved us for is to be made in the image and likeness of his son. Why? Because that's what he originally did with Adam. He wants to get us back to what man was before the devil came in and messed up everything. Mm -hmm. 
Pastor Dave, I have a question. Um, now, uh, I'm thinking about last week's message, you know, and uh, that whole John 14 meditation thing and this message. And my, my question is, if we were to distill down image of Christ, how much of that, to make it plain, how much of that is one word, obedience? How much of the image of Christ is obedience? It's a good question, James. That, that's that's a good that's a good question. That's a great. Jesus said, "I didn't come to do my will, but the will of Him that sent me." That's a good point. It's a good point Be, because the current the the current systems and structures have created a mindset for us as Christians where we rationalize and we justify not being obedient and making ourselves feel comfortable with a lack of obedience, with carnality, carnality in our lives, with, with not having a commitment to pursue Christ-likeness in our lives reflected through obedience. As long as we engage in the system, keep the wheels of the machinery operating and going, fine. But that doesn't help the individual. And so what happens is we don't have, we, we, when we don't have this, this resonant manifestation of resurrection power in our lives, and we recognize when we don't have it, let's be honest, we recognize when we don't have it, then what do we do? We look for something to tap into as a surrogate. So we look for something that we think is spiritually popping and spiritually happening. And we plug into that as a surrogate for the lack of our own resurrection power in our lives. And we go and we engage and we put on the mask and we put on the face. And then we go back and we lay in our beds at night and stare in the darkness and say, God, how come I don't experience you? How come... Why, 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 why isn't my life what you want it to be? Paul had this perspective, man. He let go. He let go of what the world values. He let go of the world's value system. And when he let that go, the love for that, he transferred that love, that passion to pursuing Christ and experiencing Christ, experiencing him, knowing him through experience. And that means dying to self so that the resurrected Christ could operate in our lives. So that new you, that new creature in Christ Jesus can only be manifested in your life as you die to self. And then the purpose of being conformed to the image and likeness of his son. Paul said, that, 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 that's what I'm living for. Now look at this in Romans 12, real quickly. And, and, and I like this. So, so there's a universal purpose for all of us to be made into the image and likeness of Christ. I love what James said in terms of what does that look like operationally in my life? A life of obedience. But then there's an individual aspect to what Christ saved us for and wants us to be. And Romans 12 says, as our bodies have many parts, each part has a special function. Drop down, it says, God has given each of us the ability to do certain things well. There's a specific calling. There's a specific purpose that God has in each of our lives. There's a universal calling to be like Christ. There's an individual calling. What is it that God's called you to do? Well, that's all. I, 
I have found that I have the greater joy when I'm in my purpose and my lane. I found that when I allow other things to prioritize my purpose, I have less joy. I may have more money. I may have more stuff. I may have more of the things Paul said, you know, I've given up and let go. I may have more of that, but I'm not going to be fulfilled. My spirit man is not going to be fulfilled. What is it that God has called me to do? The institution and the system always identifies that in a structure and capacity that perpetuates the institution. And there's nothing wrong with serving in a church. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is this verse speaks to more than that. It speaks to more than that. Because then we think about purpose only in the sense of the institution. And we don't think about purpose in the larger context of our life because in the institution, right, whether you're Baptist, that's a three-hour service on Sunday, whether you're contemporary, it's an hour 15, 90-minute service on Sunday. What about the rest of your life? Certainly God has purpose in that. And what does that look like? Paul said that the resurrection in his encounter with a resurrected Jesus, it changed his perspective, it changed his passion, and it changed his purpose. He wanted to fulfill the reason God saved him in the first place. And then lastly, the resurrection changes what we pursue. It changes what we pursue. Verse 13, Paul says, no, dear brothers and sisters, I'm still not all I should be. Look at the humility in Paul. He's accomplished all this. He says, no, nah, I ain't arrived. But watch this. What, look, look, at this look at how he says this about pursuit. He says, but I'm focusing all my energies on this one That's a powerful, powerful, structured statement. All my energies on one thing. All my energies on one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us up to heaven. How does a man go from destroying the church to being the prime vehicle by which God builds the church? He had an encounter with a resurrected Jesus. That encounter, it changed what Paul valued. It changed his perspective. It changed his passion. What he valued. It, it changed his purpose. And it changed his pursuit. Because he no longer valued the things of the world. Because he wanted to know Christ and experience Christ. And the power of the resurrection as he died to self. And as he died to self, it empowered him to pursue the purpose of becoming more like Christ. And obtaining the thing God called him into the kingdom for in the first place. And what enabled him to be persistent in all of that. Is he was in pursuit of something. And what he was in pursuit of was not earthly. 
It wasn't temporal. It wasn't of this world. When we look at these verses, what is it that Paul says he's in, he's in pursuit of? What is it that he is focusing all of his energies, all of his energies? What is the thing that he's looking forward to? The thing that lies ahead. What is that one thing when we look at verse 14 that is his pursuit? Isn't it being home with the Lord? Being home with the Lord. Being home with the Lord. And not just being home with him. That's part of it. Okay. Absolutely. And he did the will of the Father. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Look Doing at the will of the Father. Look at the text. Look at verse 14. And for those who, who, who can see your Receive screen. Receive the prize. Receive the prize. Receive the prize. Receive the prize. And what is the prize? The crown? Uh, well, <laughs> no. Oh, that's the question right there. Well, now. Yeah, right? What is the prize? Oh, go ahead. Well, now hold on. Let me give you. Let me. Let me give you. Let me give you um, 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 a couple of others, right? So Paul talks about how he ran his race. That run in such a way that you will win. All athletes practice self control. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. This ideal of a prize. It was consistent in Paul's language and ideals, right? He says so. I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. He says, I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what I should do. Why? Because I'm in pursuit of something and I'm in pursuit of this prize. So Brenda, to your point, what is the prize? We taught on this a little bit, but we didn't really teach on this a lot. There are five crowns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The crown of righteousness is that, what he's seeking. <laughs> that we will receive. And this is what people don't understand. People say, we're going to all get to heaven. Yes, if you're a believer in Christ, listen. You believe in Christ, listen. Go here, Pastor. <laughs> you, you can live all kinds of crazy stuff. If, if, if you have genuine faith in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, I believe in the eternal security of the belief. I don't believe everybody says the prayer is saved just because it said the prayer. I believe that there's a framework, there's a recipe God gives us for salvation. If you follow that recipe, you're in. The issue becomes, I can, I can live a defeated Christian life, still make it to heaven. But when I make it to heaven and I stand before Jesus, remember, Paul talked about um, receiving rewards. Wood, wood, straw, stubble, gold or silver, right? There's different levels of rewards we're going to get. And the church has robbed people of this truth. And so people don't understand that the life we live today, the choices and decisions we make today, whether or not we're willing to have our perspective change, our passions change, our purposes change, and our pursuits change, have an eternal effect and consequence. We've all heard the saying about how we're going to, the, 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 the book of, I'm about to get real passionate, let me catch myself, how the book of Revelation talks about, um, that it gives the picture of, of, of casting crowns before the Lord, because anything that we achieve, we achieve it because of him, so we give him, we give it all back to him. Now, I don't know if there's actual crowns we're going to receive, but the Bible gives us the framework in the picture that the crown, in other words, there's going to be an acknowledgement there's going to be an acknowledgement. A crown represents a level of authority, right? A level of, of dominion. And, and the dominion, the authority that we've exercised in life, that's going to be acknowledged in heaven. We're going to stand before Jesus and have to give an account for our lives, what we did and what we didn't do. And you ain't going to be able to blame the fact that you got mad at this Christian or mad at that Christian, and that's why you didn't do what you needed to do. That's a part that we don't really teach in the body because that makes people uncomfortable because that puts a demand on what James was talking about earlier for our obedience. And we don't like that. 
because we like a Christianity that's convenient, that doesn't demand anything from us, and that justifies all of our carnality. Paul says, listen, at the end of the day, what motivated me in all of this was I realized that that resurrected Jesus that I encountered, he's going to give me a prize if I'm faithful to do what he called me to do. If I maintain a changed perspective, if I maintain a changed passion, if I maintain a change in my purpose, and if I maintain a change in my pursuits, that's how this man who was committed to destroying the church became the prime instrument by which God built the church. These changes, perspective, passion, purposes, and pursuits. If these things aren't reflected, guys, in our own lives, it's difficult, if not impossible, for us to fully experience the power of what transformational Christianity really is about. We will only be limited to cultural Christianity, institutional Christianity. And there's so much more that the Father has for you to experience. But it begins here. This is how Paul ends this. And it's interesting the way he ends this. So he, he's, he's just laid out his manifesto, right? He, he's telling us what the secret sauce to his, his, to his spiritual success and accomplishments are, right? And then he says this. So, someone read verse 15 for us. I hope all of you who are mature Christians will agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. It's almost as if Paul knew we'd be having this conversation today. And it's almost as if Paul, 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 through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, listen. I'm hoping that all of you will come to an agreement about how the resurrection changes our perspective, our passion, our purpose, and our pursuits. So I hope you, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope my, 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 my drivers as a result of what I experienced with the resurrected Jesus. If you say that you've experienced the resurrected Jesus, I hope you agree with these things. I hope you embrace these things. He says, but if you disagree on any of these elements, he says, I believe God will make a plain to you. That, that, that he commends all of us into God's loving arms, God's correcting arms. And he says, hey, if any of these areas you're not in alignment with, I'm believing God will make a plain to you. And I'm, Dave Jones, today, am believing that God will make a plain to all of us, myself included. about my own perspective, my own passion, my own pursuits, my own purposes. And that we move past the rhetoric game, talking the game. And we set a new standard amongst ourselves, living the game. Because for Paul, the evidence that he encountered a resurrection Jesus was in his life. We tell the world we encountered a resurrected Jesus. Or maybe we just joined the church. Or maybe we just 
needed God's help to fix a marriage or to get a job or to be bailed out of some circumstance or situation. But if we've encountered a resurrected Jesus, there should be evidence in our lives. Real evidence. That's the goal. All right, fine.